right, guys? You got to get on your feet for this song. I need all the kids to get up. Come on now, clap your hands. Come on, kids. There's beauty in my brokenness, and I've got true love instead of pain. There's freedom, though you captured me, and I've got joy instead of mourning. Help me sing it. beauty in my brokenness. I've got true love. I've got true love instead of Joy down deep in my soul, my soul. Down deep in my soul. Yes, you do. Down deep in my soul. Cause you give me joy. Down deep in my soul. Down deep in my soul. Down deep. Come on, y'all, let's sing that again. There's beauty, there's beauty in my brokenness. I've got you love. I got you love instead of pain. There's freedom. Joy instead of morning. You guys got it? Cause you give me joy down, down deep in my soul. My soul. Down deep in my soul. Yes, you do. Down deep Let's take in it my soul. Come on now. Cause I feel your joy. Down deep in my soul. In my soul. Down deep in my soul. Yeah. Down deep in my soul. Listen. I've never been so free. Caught in your love for me, you love. Never been more secure knowing your heart, Lord. Never been so free. Caught in your love for me. Never been more secure. Come on now. Cause you give me joy. Down deep in my soul. Down deep in my soul. Down deep in my soul. You give me joy. Down deep in my soul. so glad to be worshiping with you this morning. Let's keep doing what we're doing and praising him and proclaiming his name as we sing songs, as we sing with our voices, whether it's on a Sunday morning or during the week at work or at school, no matter what we're doing, that our lives proclaim his name. Let's sing this song together. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
song to him, church. Good morning and welcome to the DFW Church. I am Walt Thomas and this is my wife, Kim. I serve as an elder in the East Worship Center. I am so grateful for the family we have in the DFW Church. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Mm -hmm. This is our kickoff weekend for 2021 and we are excited to begin mm -hmm. the year with some training mm -hmm. to strengthen our focus for a new year. 
This afternoon, our guest speakers will be hosting additional training for all our DFW church members. The men's session will begin at 1 p.m. and the women's session will begin at 3 p.m. If you're visiting with us, we welcome you to join us as well. You can find the Zoom links in the show notes below. Before we continue with our worship service this morning, I want to share with you about some of the great things happening in Hope Worldwide. With your help, Hope received over $2 million in COVID-19 relief efforts. Aid has been provided through 252 churches in 65 countries, helping to feed over 50,000 people in need. I hope you are encouraged to know that your giving is having an impact around the world. However, there are many local needs that we can meet as well. This upcoming weekend, we will have our annual MLK Day of Service. Each worship center has organized a project to serve the local community. I encourage you to find out how to serve and continue bringing hope and the love of Jesus to the community around you. Please join me in the word of prayer. Heavenly Father God, thank you for this morning that we as a church can worship you, that we can lift up your name, that we can sing songs and lift our hearts to you. Father, at this time, may you bless this service. Also bless the local uh, projects that we do in Hope Worldwide uh, in the MLK Day of Service. May the hope and the love of Jesus be brought to many people in our community. This we pray in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And at this time, we'll continue our service by heading over to Kids Corner. Good morning and welcome to Kids Corner. My name is Chad Wolf and this is my family. My name is Lori. I'm Jonah. I'm Mark. I'm Keenan. I'm Ethan. And I'm Ella. And we are the Wolf Pack. So can we sing a song? Yes. Let's sing a song. All right. Take two. Good morning. Today, we're going to be singing The Sea of Galilee. This is going to be a fun song that requires hand motions and it's best standing up. Me and Mark are going to show you. So, whenever you hear these words, there's going to be a hand motion. So there's fish, nets, hands, men, boat, and the Sea of Galilee. Are you ready? All right, everybody stand up. There's a sea, there's a sea, there's a sea of Galilee. There's a sea, there's a sea, there's a sea of Galilee. There's a sea, there's a sea, there's a sea of Galilee. There's a boat on the sea of Galilee. There's a boat on the sea of Galilee. There's a boat, there's a boat, there's a boat on the sea of Galilee. There are men on the boat in the sea of Galilee. There are men on the boat in the sea of Galilee. There are men, there are men. There are men in the boat in the Sea of Galilee. There are hands on the men in the boat in the Sea of Galilee. There are hands on the men in the boat in the Sea of Galilee. There's hands, there's hands, there's hands on the men in the boat in the Sea of Galilee. There are nets in the hands in the men in the boat in the Sea of Galilee. There are nets in the hands in the men in the boat in the Sea of Galilee. There are nets, there are nets, there are nets in the hands of the men in the boat in the Sea of Galilee. There's fish in the nets and the hands of the men in the boat in the Sea of Galilee. There's fish in the nets and the hands of the men in the boat in the Sea of Galilee. There's fish, there's fish, there's fish in the nets and hands of the men in the boat in the Sea of Galilee. There's many, many fish in the nets and hands of the men in the boat in the Sea of Galilee. There's many, many fish in the nets and hands of the men in the boat in the Sea of Galilee. There's many, many fish, many, many fish, many, many fish in the nets and hands of the men in the boat in the Sea of Galilee. All right, family. All right, let's. Our devotional today, we're going to be talking about love. 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 What do you think about when you hear the word love? love. Uh, I think about friendships. Love friendships? is kind. Kind. And sharing and joyful. And I think it's fun. Fun? Okay. Laughter. Laughter. Love. Family. Family. Okay. Let's 
Let's get into God's Word and see what God says love is. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And as you're yeah. going there, um, verses 4 through 8 tells us what love is. <laughs> What's the first thing that God says love is? It says love is patient. Patient. Love is a patient? Hello. I am Dr. Mark, and welcome to my clinic. And who is my patient today? Uh, my name is Love. Love? Well, not exactly. So you see, patience is something that you really want, but you have to wait for it. Like taking turns. Yeah. Yeah! I <laughs> love can I have a turn? <laughs> wait your turn. Now wait your turn. <laughs> oh, whoa! Ow, hey! Ow, ow, One, ow, two, ow, three, eyes on me! Everybody ow, stop! Ow, what happened? He, he kicked me! He, you, did you wait your turn? Were you patient? You weren't? Okay, let's go have a talk real quick. <laughs> hey, Ethan. I wanted to talk to you about what happened on the swing. Can you tell mommy what happened? You wanted to turn? I see. Were you being patient with Ella? You weren't? Okay, so when we need to be patient, there's a song that we sing. Do you remember that song? Can you try? It starts with be patient. Be patient with everyone. Be patient with everyone. Be patient with everyone. First Thessalonians 5 verse 14. That's right, Ethan. Do you know what being patient shows someone? When we are patient, we are showing them love. God tells us in 1 Corinthians in um, chapter 13, love is patient. It's the first thing that God tells us. Love is patient. So when we are being patient with someone, we're showing them love. Can you love your sister? Okay. You ready to do it to it? Yeah. Let's go. So how do we show each other to be patient? At the time that me and John played the game together. Hey, Jonah. Can you play Beard Wizards with me? Uh, sure. Can I finish folding my laundry first? Yeah. I'll be waiting at the table when you're done. Okay. I finished folding my laundry, Keenan. I'm gonna go put it up and I'll be down. Okay. I'll be waiting for you. Thank you for being very patient. So, how do we play? First, we need to get to the bottom to get the. Keenan, that was a great example. So, this week, let's look at things, ways that we can be an example and be patient with those around us. Have a great week. Bye! Bye. What an amazing time of worship mm. we've had so far. This morning, we are joined by guest speakers, Will and Tasha Archer. Mm. The Archers bring a wealth of wisdom. Having served as ministers for the last 20 years in churches from Philadelphia to Georgia, and even in the Bahamas. For the mm. past six years, they've been leading the Potomac Valley Church in Fredericksburg, Virginia. The title mm. of the lesson this morning is A Clarion Call to Greater Faith. We have one more song before the lesson.
Good morning. It is such an honor to be able to speak to the church in Dallas. I've heard so much about your faith and your love for God. 
Uh, I've been so inspired by how God has been moving in the churches in Texas and uh, so encouraged by all the conversations that I've been able to have with Todd over the years and definitely over the past several months. I'm so grateful for Todd and Patty and the great way that they're leading the Dallas church. And for any other brothers and sisters that are listening to this conversation this morning, I definitely want to express uh, the warmest and richest of greetings from us here in the Potomac Valley Church. And uh, what a great honor it is for me to be able to speak to all of you this morning. God is doing amazing things uh, in our fellowship, uh, in the church there. And truly, as we go into 2021, God wants to do even greater things. Uh, my name is Will Archer, and I serve here in the Potomac Valley Church, and, um, and I've had the, the, the great honor to be able to speak to you this morning. Um, I've been married for 21 years uh, to my wife, Tasha, God bless her, for sticking with me for 21 years. And we have two kids, uh, Makai, who's 17, and he's a disciple, and, uh, and Journey, who's 12, and she's full of en energy, and she's crazy and a wild preteen. And we've been struggling, like many of you have, uh, over the past several months, um, navigating the realities of uh, online school, um, of, you know, just kind of uh, parenting during a pandemic, dealing with all the challenges of life. And uh, we're just very, very grateful, though, that on a Sunday morning, we can come together to be able to worship God and to learn from His Word. Uh, this morning, I'm going to share some thoughts with you. Uh, from the, primarily from the book of John, uh, on the theme of greater every day. And, um, and also, I'm going to share a little bit about uh, our life and our ministry and what we've been learning in hopes that it would encourage you in your faith and your walk with God to do even greater things and to be greater every day as you walk closely with Jesus in 2021. I believe that we are at the greatest time in human history, the greatest time in American history, the greatest time in the history of our churches. And I believe that 2021 by faith will be the greatest year for the DFW church and for anyone that joins us in this conversation. Let's go to God in a word of prayer, and then we're going to dig right into the Bible. Let's pray. Our God and Father, I pray that you can open the eyes of our hearts, that you truly can help us to see you, not not anything else, and that, God, you can silence the noise of the day that's all around us. We've had a week filled with um, tumult and, and challenge and, and, and also terrific, amazing things that, that you've been doing in all of our lives, God. And there's so much noise in the world around us, God. In this time of worship, in this time where we hear from your word, we pray that you can silence the noise of the day, that you can silence the noise even within us, God, and help us to hear your clear voice, your clarion call, God, uh, to greatness, your clarion call to righteousness and truth. God, we pray that your word would open our eyes and, and help us to draw closer than we've ever drawn before, and that you would be glorified by everything that we learn today and that we put into practice as we walk forward with you. We pray all these things with great confidence in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I remember the first time I opened the Bible. Um, I was born in Illinois. My mom's from Chicago, and I'm um, a second generation uh, Polish immigrant from Chicago, and my dad's from Jamaica. When my dad moved to Illinois to do his doctorate at Northwestern, um, he converted to Islam. And so um, my mom is Catholic, and my dad is, is Muslim, and, um, and so I grew up. Um, Sunni Muslim. I went with my dad when I was just eight years old uh, to Mecca and to Medina uh, in Saudi Arabia and I uh, did the Hajj. Uh, I grew up praying five times a day uh, as an active Sunni Muslim. And when I was 12 years old, though, my aunt gave me a Bible and I read the Bible for the first time. And I've been reading the Bible for 33 years since because when I opened the Bible and I really just read the Bible, and I read the Bible, mind you, from a non-Christian lens. I was blown away by Jesus. I was blown away by his love, by his compassion. And I was compelled from that reading of Scripture to want to follow Jesus and learn more about who he is. 
You know, by God's grace and mercy, I spent the next several years going to lots of different churches, Catholic churches, the, the faith of my mom, Seventh-day Adventist churches, the faith of so many of my family members, Pentecostal churches and uh, non-denominational churches, churches that were big and small, asking questions, really trying to figure out who God is and what it really means to be a Christian. And when I was 18 years old, I walked into a Bible talk in the Bronx, New York. I'd moved to New York to go to college. Went to start out in college at City University of New York. And, um, and I walked into a Bible talk, started studying the Bible, and in August 22nd of 1993, I got baptized as a disciple of Jesus. My life has been radically different since. By God's grace, I spent the next uh, few years in New York, uh, you know, really learning how to preach on the trains. So if you say amen during this sermon, uh, you're not going to throw me off. And, uh, and I always have to learn how to manage my volume because I learned how to preach on the one train and the two train and the nine train in the Bronx and how to share my faith uh, in, in very dynamic and diverse communities. By God's grace, though, I moved from New York to Atlanta, and that's where I had the opportunity to meet my wife, Tasha, and we both went in the ministry in 1998. By God's grace, we had, we had the opportunity to serve there in the Atlanta church in, in the ministry and then later to move to Macon to lead the church there. Later, we had the opportunity to move to Philadelphia to lead the teen ministry in Philly, and then to the Bahamas to lead the churches in the Bahamas. After we'd appointed uh, local Bahamian leaders, we came back to the U.S. and we got to serve at the University of Georgia uh, with the campus ministry and lead those amazing college students at the University of Georgia. And then by God's grace and God's mercy, we've moved here to Virginia, and now we serve here in Potomac Valley, and we've been here for almost seven years, preaching the gospel and raising up leaders, and we've seen nothing but miracles happen. But my life was changed when I opened the Bible. And I believe today as we open the Bible that your life can change. Maybe you've been reading the Bible your entire life, or maybe this is your first time looking at the scriptures. And whether you're coming at it as I did initially from a non-Christian lens or you're coming at it from, a, the, from eyes that have read the scriptures many times, my prayer is that as we look at these scriptures today, that you can see them anew and you can hear the voice of Jesus, the voice that changed my life, the voice that changes every life, the, the voice that gives life to everyone in every way, because Jesus is the Son of God and the author of life itself. Let's turn on over to John chapter 14 and verse 12. Jesus is having a very interesting conversation here with his disciples. He's getting them ready for uh, his exit from, 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 um, from the stage, if you will. He's been preparing them for the past three years. They've seen him do miracles. They've seen him at this point walk on water. They've seen him raise the dead. They've seen him do what no one's ever done. They've seen him feed 5,000. They've seen him stand up to the religious leaders. They've seen him with the gentleness that he has towards women and towards the oppressed. And they've seen him with the fiery intensity that he has towards the religious establishment set against change. And then in John 14, 12, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. We're in a time where we need truth. I tell you the truth. Anyone, anyone who has faith in me will do what I've been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask for anything in my name, and I will do it. Jesus looks at his disciples as he looks at you and as he looks at me. And he says what every parent that's healthy says to their child, 
I want you to be greater. I want you to do greater things than me. The goal of every generation is to pass on to the next generation the capacity for even greater things. You want your kids to get more education. You want them to have more opportunities. You want them to do even greater things. And that's how Jesus looks at his disciples. And that's how Jesus looks at you. See, Jesus understood that his world, which is a world of just a few million people, was so much smaller than our world. Our world now has 7 billion people. In the next 30 years, we're projected to be a world of 10 billion people. There are more people that you can connect with on Facebook with a post than lived in the entire known world in the days of Jesus. So it is reasonable that you and I can do and should do even greater things. But what's amazing about this is that Jesus is Jesus. You can't get greater than Jesus. But Jesus isn't saying you're going to be greater than me. He's saying you're going to do greater things. That your impact can be so much more expansive. And that's God's desire for you, as it is desire of every healthy parent for their child. I remember when I read this scripture, I struggled, honestly, for a decade over this passage because I couldn't make my mind, I couldn't wrap my mind around what Jesus was saying. But it brought me back to a conversation I had with my dad when I was seven years old. This is before we, we moved. Uh, my dad was a college professor and he had moved to Saudi Arabia, he and I together, to go and teach. And we're living in Jamaica and at our home in Jamaica, in, in, in Martha Bray Trelawney, there's a set of stairs that lead down from my dad's office. And we sat on those stairs. And I'll never forget sitting on those stairs. And my dad, who's six foot four, you know, went to Northwestern, one of the youngest people in his class, uh, 3.9 GPA out of Northwestern for his PhD. I mean, brilliant, 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 smart guy. And sat down beside him, and he said, you know, my middle name is Erasmus, and he said to me, he said, Erasmus, you know, you're going to be greater than me. You're going to do amazing things with your life. And I remember that was terrifying. And, and for much of my life, that's been a terrifying prospect. I, I am uh, not good at a lot of things. I, I'm good at two things. I, I'm good at voice. I love to speak to people and vision. I believe in people. And I believe that God can do anything. But other than vision and voice, I struggle with most other things. It, you know, like, it takes me a long time to change a tire. It takes me a long time to fix stuff. I'm not good at a lot of stuff. I'm, I'm not the smartest guy in the world. And my dad is brilliant and tall and handsome and articulate. And I thought, man, I can't, I, I couldn't possibly be like you, dad. And I remember the shadow of that hung over me. And hung over me for a long time until I became a parent with children. And I realized this is just what parents do. They want the best for their kids. God wants the best, the very best for you. This morning, I pray that you recognize how loved you are. And the fact that God is calling you to great things was not intended to put pressure on you to produce great results, but to recognize that you are greatly loved and you are greatly aided by God as you go into the world. And I pray that the scriptures we look at next will help us to understand this at a deep and meaningful level. Turn on over with me to John chapter 13 and verse 34. Prior to this, Jesus says in John 13, 34, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know, everybody will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. 
It is our love that is our greatest asset, our love that is our greatest testimony, our love that shows who we are. We are called to live a cruciform life. Brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors in the DFW church, we are called to go into the world like this. As you go into 2021, you don't need to go in guarded. You don't need to go in with your dukes up. You need to stretch your arms out wide, loving those on the right and loving those on the left and having the courage to walk unencumbered in the world, not defensive, not in a weird, worldly, offensive posture, but in a godly, offensive posture. This is how Jesus lived his life. This is how Jesus ended his life. And this is how Jesus calls us to live, loving all people. That is who we are. We are and always have been a church for all people. And that is the thing we celebrate. We celebrate our rich diversity. But I got to be honest with you. There are so many more people who desperately need to hear the gospel in your neighborhood, at your school, at your job, in your social network. And the way that you share the gospel is not simply by professing knowledge, because knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. It's by demonstrating your love for God by the way that you love people. You know, this understanding has radically changed my faith because I've come to recognize that we are not called simply to hold on to orthodoxy, though we are called to hold on to that which is sound. Orthodoxy is sound teaching. And we, we have great confidence, as I know you do in the DFW Church, as we do in the Potomac Valley Church, great confidence and great conviction in the fact that we teach sound salvation doctrine. Simple faith in Jesus. We teach that people should believe in Jesus, that they should repent of their sins, and that they should get baptized. And that when they do, they receive the forgiveness of their sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. We teach a simple and clear gospel. And we need to teach that with boldness. What we have to also recognize is that orthodoxy has to be matched by orthopraxy, the practice of our faith that shows our faith by what we do. Because faith without deeds is dead. And right now, in Texas, in Virginia, in America, and in the world, we need Christianity. We need Christians, Christians, Jesus followers who teach what is right and who practice what is right. But that is shown by our love. Turn on over with me, if you will, to John chapter 17. In John chapter 17, it's always good to read things in context. And when we read John 14, we need to understand the context of John 13 and also understand where Jesus is going in John 17. In John 17 and verse 20, it says, My prayer is not for you alone. Talking to his disciples. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. We don't live in a world where people are one. In almost all of our communities, People are at least more than one. People are divided. There's a fundamental lack of unity. What will bring about unity? Jesus says this, Father, just as you are in me and I'm in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you've sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you've loved me. You know, you can say that you're one without being one. We can say that we are united when truly we are either uniformed or we're just unilaterally kind of painting 
a facade of unity. True unity is only found in us having a singular Lord, Jesus. A singular commitment to follow Jesus. And a commitment to engage in the world with that singular conviction. Now let me just be clear. Personally, it is my deepest conviction from 33 years of examining these scriptures that every believer born with free will has the right to have opinions about lots of things. I'm sure right there in Dallas, there are a bunch of y'all that are following America's team and you're cowboys. And anyone who's not a cowboy, you got issues with them. You know, and there, there's some folks up here that you know that are following the Washington football team. You know, and, and, you know, and you might have differences with those of us that are following this team or that team. You can have opinions about a wide array of things. We can have differences in our views about politics and political parties. But let's be clear, right here, right now, we are called to be greater. We are called to love. And we are called to have a unity that literally shows the world who God is. But how is that accomplished? I'm so glad that you asked, because the Bible offers the answer. Turn on over, if you will, to 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul is talking to the church in Corinth, and, and he explains something that when I read it, it stopped me in my tracks. Because it helped me to understand what Jesus was saying in John 14, 12. What Jesus was calling us to in John 13, 34. What Jesus was expecting in John 17. And how it would be accomplished. And that it would only be accomplished through the active, powerful work of the Holy Spirit. It says this in John, in uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to start off in verse 7 for context. We're going to read a little bit of scripture here. It says, Now if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness. For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what is fading away came with glory, how much greater, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Verse 12. Therefore, because everything I said before Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. See, we are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing as it, at it while its radiance was fading away. But their minds were made dull. For to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But when any, when, whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. I hope you caught it. But let me just review it in case you didn't catch it. There is something greater. And that greater thing is not one Jesus. See, a single seed, as Jesus said, would have to die so that it would produce many seeds. Jesus' life shows us the example. Jesus' death shows us the example. But Jesus' resurrection unleashes an opportunity that transforms everything because Jesus' resurrection leads to 
the promise of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in every believer. So that we are no longer contending with one Jesus in the world, but with 12, but with 120, but with 3,000. There in Dallas, there are many people that believe in God who stand up for truth. And without a doubt, we're not the only Christians, but we are called to be Christians. And so I want to speak clearly to the amazing DFW church. God has blessed you. I've heard of your faith. You know, back in 2003, I remember coming to Dallas for the first time and visiting the church there at a very difficult time in our church's history. But I've heard of your faith over the years. I've heard of, and I've, I've looked at some of the, the demographic information about how uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth area is growing in amazing ways. My question is, is your faith growing even proportional to the population growth that's happening around you? Is your faith growing proportional to the challenges that we face in the world around us? Or is your faith being put underneath a table, put underneath the bed? You're not bringing your light up for your faith to shine like never before. The Dallas church is awesome. I'm speaking to the brothers and sisters who've been entrusted with the Holy Spirit, who believe, who've repented, who've been baptized, who've received the forgiveness of their sins, and now you've received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. This scripture says that we need to be very bold. And once I understood this, I realized that we can no longer go through the side door. We need to go through the front door as we engage in the world. You know, a lot of times as Christians, either out of a sense of humility or insecurity, false humility or insecurity, we're not very bold in the world. We're not very confident. Darkness is very bold. Falsehood is very bold. But the scriptures say that the righteous should be bold as a lion. And the wicked flee when no one pursues. We need to be very bold right now. Bold in our love for all people. That's a decision that we've made here in the Potomac Valley Church. And I just want to let you know, we're a broken group of people. We're a messed up group of people here in Potomac Valley. And, and just so you know, I, I'm not talking bad about the church behind their back. We, we know that about ourselves. And we say it every single Sunday. You can watch the tape. You'll always hear me say it because we are just normal folks here. You know, we're, we're, we're a church literally on the highway. In 2008, we, we were bitterly divided. And we struggled with when President Obama was elected. And, and we've had to work through deep issues of political tension and insecurity and, and, and attitudes and feelings. But by God's mercy and God's grace, we made a decision as a congregation to fast and pray. We invited in awesome brothers, Ed, Anton, and Phil Booker to come in to call us to repentance back in, in 2014, 2015, 2016 to really help us with our faith. And we made a decision to devote ourselves to God. And God himself, though we, we're broken and, and, and messed up group of people, God has moved and done incredible things. You know, I just want to share a few bits of good news as we've embraced what we're reading about from the scripture to be very bold and a commitment to truly engage in the world with an understanding that God calls us to be greater every day. By God's mercy, we saw our congregation go from 135 disciples to over 252 disciples in just a four-year period, which has been an amazing blessing. And I, and I look forward to sharing more of the details with you guys personally when we, we talk later on this afternoon. You know, by God's mercy, we've also seen God do miracles as we've seen uh, 10 deacons and 10 deaconesses, 20 in our deaconship be appointed, two amazing elders and their wives be appointed here in the congregation. 
by God's mercy and kindness. Last year, we're able to purchase two buildings. So now we function in two campuses with two buildings that God has blessed us with. God has done miracles, but the great miracles are not simply the ones that have been a direct blessing to the Christians, but a direct blessing to those in our broader community. You know, last year, at the, the height of the, the racial tension in our country, I was so encouraged that the, the chair of the Board of Supervisors, effectively the mayor in the area where we live, reached out to us and said, you know, we would love for Potomac Valley to be able to host a community conversation to bring political leaders and faith leaders together because we know that the church is committed to a cruciform posture, committed to loving those on the right as much as you love those on the left without showing partiality towards anyone. In the midst of a crisis, I'm so encouraged that our friends in the community know that we are truly Christians who love all people. By God's mercy, just a month ago, we're able to work together with the community to help to distribute $450,000 worth of relief help to keep people in their homes, to keep the lights on, to pay for childcare, to pay for medicine. This is a small, tiny church on the side of a highway that God's allowed to do amazing things because we've embraced this truth that we are not like Moses. We don't have to put a veil over our face because our faith is diminishing. Because sometimes as Christians, we feel like when I have a quiet time, that's when I got my shine on. And I don't want people to see my weaknesses. Instead, we're called to be New Testament believers filled with the Spirit of God. A spirit that enables every believer to do and to be greater every single day. I want to end out our conversation by sharing one more scripture with you. The word of God has changed our lives, has changed my life, and I pray today sinks deep into your heart. I could share miracle after miracle that I've seen in our small church here, but I share these things not to boast about the Potomac Valley Church, though I'm incredibly proud of our fellowship, but rather to challenge your faith. See, you live in Dallas. You, you live in Texas. You live in a big city. You are called to great things. And just like Jesus said to his disciples, I want to say to you as one disciple to another, God is calling the DFW church. God is calling every disciple in that church. God is calling all of our friends and our neighbors who are joining us for worship today, not simply to believe in a great God, but to follow that great God to do even greater things in 2021 and beyond. Turn on over to Matthew chapter 11. We're going to close out our conversation right here. And I pray that the things we've talked about today encourage your faith as you have encouraged us by your faith. Matthew chapter 11, I love what Jesus says right here in verse 11. Again, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. I tell you the truth. Among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater, nobody greater than John the Baptist. Yet he who is the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than than he. Did you know that? Greatest prophet in the New Testament, in the, in, the New, in the Old Testament, the last prophet, the prophet that bridges the two Testaments, John the Baptist, the only man that got to baptize Jesus Christ, bold and filled with the Spirit of God from birth, an honorable, righteous man, the greatest Old Testament prophet. Even you and I, when we're doing horrible, maybe you had a hard time even making it to the screen today, a hard time making it to, to the gathering of believers today. Maybe you and your wife had a fight today. Maybe it's been a rough past couple of months. Maybe 2020 was 
that are absolutely tumultuous and terrible for you. At your lowest low, if you will embrace the message of Jesus, if you will believe in Jesus, if you repent of your sins, if you will be baptized and receive the forgiveness of your sins, there's a spirit that God's going to put in you and that God has put in you, which makes you greater than John the Baptist. I pray as you go into the rest of your Sunday and you go into the rest of 2021 and you go into the rest of this third decade in the 21st century, the most dynamic decade is what it promises to be. 2020, 2021 to, to 2030 promises to be the most dynamic decade in human history. I pray that you go in with a spirit of boldness, that you embrace the truth that I learned from my father at seven years old, that you're going to do great things. But that that truth doesn't hang over you like a shadow, that you don't feel the pressure and the, the, the weight of that greatness, but instead that you feel the power and the strength of that greatness, because that greatness comes from the Spirit of God. I pray that greatness frees you to, to live a life of righteousness, to say no to ungodliness and worldly passion. It frees you from, from the empty things of this world, from hatred and division and discord and, 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 and vitriol. It frees you from that kind of living to a transformative life, a cruciformed life, where you're able to love all people and extend your arms to all people, where you're able to go into the world, not with your dukes up, but with your arms wide open, knowing that wherever you go, whatever you do, God goes with you. My dear brothers and sisters, who I love with all of my heart, I thank you so much for your faith and your faithfulness. And I challenge you with every ounce of my being. And I encourage you with every ounce of my being to embrace the words of Jesus. I tell you the truth. God is calling you to be greater and to be greater every day. I pray you have a great Sunday and a greater Monday and a greater Tuesday and a greater Wednesday and a greater Thursday and Friday and Saturday. And the next time we gather as believers, I pray you will reflect on a week and then a month and then a year that is defined not by the past, by our weaknesses and by our failings, but by the power of God and by His embrace and your embrace of Him and the greatness that He calls you to walk in. May God richly bless you in all you do and may you be led by God to do even greater things, and to truly be greater every single day. God bless. Thanks so much, Will, for sharing your heart. And thank you mm -hmm. so much for joining us this morning. Mm -hmm. It has been a joy to worship together. Mm -hmm. Please join us this afternoon at the Zoom links below as we continue our 2021 kickoff weekend. As always, you can find more information about the DFW Church from YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook, or log into our official website at the link below. Four years ago, two couples had a dream of a vibrant worship center inside the city limits of Dallas. With just a dream and some faith, they began a Saturday morning Bible talk to reach out to their friends and neighbors. Since then, the Dallas City Group has seen multiple baptisms a restoration, and disciples moving in from all around the country. A group that started as four has now grown to almost 30 people. Please pray for us as we strive to be faithful. We dream of a vibrant campus ministry and multiple Bible talks 
around the city of 1.3 million people. If you know anyone that lives or works in the city of Dallas and may be interested, please have them reach out to us. We would love to have them join us. And again, please pray for the Dallas City Group.
My sins away. 